one more emergency. Yes, we just did Rob. Okay, stay on the line. Okay. Is anyone hurt? No. The guy just walked out with a, I don't know how much cash in a bag. He had a bomb or something wrapped around his neck. He's sitting in the parking lot on the Upper Peach. I'm watching him out my rear view mirror right now. The man told police that the bomb had been strapped to his body and that he was forced to rob the bank. Real Crime Profile is brought to you by many sponsors who support our podcast, from Casper mattresses to Quip toothbrushes to Madison Reed hair color to Sun Basket to so many others. So please, when you hear our sponsor, do check out the promo codes and the special offers for our listeners, and also go to realcrimeprofile.com where you can get up-to-date information on our latest sponsors and the latest special offers they have for our listeners. Remember, we can't do this without you, and we certainly can't do it without our sponsors. So thank you all for supporting Real Crime Profile. I first heard about the suffering and death of my brother, Brian, on the news. Brian was handcuffed. The officers continued to point their guns at him, even though he was fully cooperating in their custody. And why was no ambulance present to try to help when he lay dying upon the ground, grasping for life? The decision was made to cut off Brian's head to preserve the collar bomb. This beheading of Brian took from us the closure we sought by being able to view Brian at his funeral. Tears streamed down mom's face as she learned the news that Brian's body was not fit for open casket viewing. The removed head could not be supported in position. More respect was shown for the destructive device than for Brian's body. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, former New York City prosecutor, retired FBI profiler and writer-producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today from across the pond is... Laura Richards, founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service and co-creator and executive producer of the case of Kaylee Anthony. And I am Lisa Zambetti. I am the casting director for Criminal Minds, where Jim Clemente is my colleague, and we've just been picked up for season 14, and we've just started back to work. It's so exciting. Um, Yeah, we've been in the writer's room for a week now, and putting together some amazing stories for season 14. Absolutely. It's pretty pretty fantastic that we're still running strong after all these seasons. Well, congratulations, guys. That's great news. Every time I think that our show is sort of pushing the limits of credibility of what really happens in true crime, just when I think we've gone too far, we find out about a case that's even crazier than any of ours. Yeah. So, Jim, you want to lead us to... Yeah. Well, this case, uh, I remember from when I was a profiler, and I believe our friend Jim Fitzgerald was either the case agent or one of the lead agents on the case. But this case was, as far as I know, unique in all of law enforcement, where we had never before had a bank robber come in to rob a bank saying that he was abducted and he had an actual live bomb around his neck that was locked on by this massive handcuff, basically. And it ends up pretty bad for him. So it was a really unique situation. And I remember when the case came in and it really baffled us as profilers because there's a lot of sort of conflicting behavior in this case. And I think that's what we're going to find out when we look at it. This was an ingenious plan, but an extremely flawed plan. So it really, it's, 
it has so many different twists. Well, this and turns. is going it's back amazing. to 2003, isn't it? So the 28th of August 2003. So this was some time ago now. This this case, but of course, it's been brought to air by Netflix. Um, it's an intense and compelling docudrama with four episodes, and you know that's great that you and Fitz actually worked on it, Jim. So you can tell us a lot of sort of the behind the scenes as well. So the name of the series that we're talking about is Evil Genius. It's a Netflix series and it's a four-parter. And each one, it's like it leaves you hanging on this cliff, just wanting to see what what happens next. And when just the beginning of the entire series is just yeah. so intriguing because they introduce you to a character and tell you about her. Um, and then sort of leave it hanging. And then all of a sudden, we're in the middle of this, I mean, it can only be described as a bizarre bank robbery, a bizarre and threatening and violent bank robbery. We should start by talking about Brian Wells. Brian Wells was sort of, you know, a regular guy, right? And he was a pizza delivery guy, um, lives in Erie, Pennsylvania, and works for a pizza place uh, delivering pizzas. So he shows up at a bank in town. He's got a t-shirt over some kind of device, which is around his neck. And he tells the teller that he's got a bomb around his neck and he wants $250,000. And then uh, it turns out he also has a cane gun that he's walking with. So those are sort of the circumstances. And we find that he's successful. He's able to get money, not 250000 I think it was around $8,000, Jim. And so it wasn't much at all. Um, again, one of the flaws in the plan. But what's interesting, if you, you know, actually start looking at this, and we should probably start with victimology, is here's a guy that doesn't have a history of any bank robberies, doesn't have a history of any violence, doesn't have a history of really anything at all in terms of criminal behavior, and yet he walks into the bank in broad daylight in the town of Erie, Pennsylvania. And you can see the, the footage. I mean, that's it. part of the documentary shows the footage of him walking very calmly into the bank. He looks odd because he's got this t- this oversized T-shirt. And it looks like if you didn't know it was a bomb, you'd think it was like a neck brace or I don't know what. He, just, he looks very odd. He's an older right. gentleman, very thin, not threatening looking, I don't think. And he just kind of walks in with a cane. And it's just very bizarre. At very, He's very calm, would you say? Would you guys agree that he walks in very kind of calm? I would definitely say he's calm, but doesn't he take a lollipop as well from the counter? He does take a lollipop. And, and that, you know, obviously when we looked at it, it, it's kind of contradictory to what we see. But then what we, were, what we talked about back then uh, in 2003 was it's possible that he took the lollipop because he was so dry, his throat was so dry, and that's one of the indicators of stress. So the lack of salivation, the reduction in salivation is, a, is an indicator of stress, and that might be what prompted him to grab a lollipop. Uh, if they had uh, you know, a water cooler or bottles of water, he might have grabbed one of them. Couldn't it also just be, you know, he's kind of infantile, you know, kind of disposition that you know, it it could go either way. He goes into the bank and he's seemingly very calm, but he has a walking stick, which is a gun and a bomb around his neck. So to pick up the lollipop seems, and just to act so calm, just seems to be very contradictory. That Yes, you could read into it, lack of, you know, saliva and being stressed, but I didn't get that impression from his disposition and his demeanor. So I'm just throwing that in the mix. Have you ever seen other surveillance of... um Robert, bank robberies before? I was on the bank robbery squad in, in the New York office, of the FBI NYPD bank robbery squad. And we had 2,000 bank robberies just in our first year. Right. So when they get the money and they leave, do they usually kind of saunter off? Kind of, I mean, he just seems so, uh, lax, uh, for lack of a better word, lackadaisical and sort of like, okay, bye, I'm leaving. I mean, he did not seem to have this urgency, like I've got to get out of here to my next thing because this bomb is going to go off or I'm in cahoots and, and I've got to get out. I mean, he just didn't act like a criminal or am I just imagining like dog day afternoon or something? 
No, I mean, I think most of the time when uh, somebody does what these are what we call a note job, but this happens to be a note job with two actually lethal weapons in them. Many note jobs are done without any weapon at all. In other words, I mean, they appear in the bank and they appear threatening in some way, or they hand a note saying that they have a bomb in the bag, a, a gun in their jacket, some other weapon that they're going to use to threaten somebody. And then they get, they basically get handed the cash in that teller's drawer right. and they leave in a hurry. They leave they're very intent on getting away. Now, he does leave the bank. He does get in his car and drive away. But here's the first part of the flaw in the plan. I mean, did they actually think that because he said he had a bomb around his neck, that the police weren't going to stop him after he robbed a bank? I mean, he got into his car and he drove down the streets where, I mean, people had seen him drive for years, apparently. Um, so it's not like he was hidden somewhere. It's not like he had a, an escape driver, a getaway car, uh, you know, some distractions that would keep the police uh, hunting in a different direction. So this was a very bad choice in terms of if, if he was involved, if he wasn't involved, it doesn't matter either way. There was literally no way he was going to actually get away. No, so it's not very well thought the out, out and it lacks urgency and any kind of real intelligent planning or decision making, which is in stark contrast to to many other of the the cases. I would imagine. I mean, that's that's how I felt watching it. I mean, you've seen far more, right. uh, you know, robberies and CCTV, you know, the camera footage than I, but it just seemed in striking contrast to what you would expect. Right. And I think, for example, Jim Fitz and I were on that squad together, uh, the bank robbery squad, and we used to, we would average six bank robberies a day. And the vast majority of them were no jobs. And there was only a percentage of them that where weapons were actually displayed. And of all the ones that threatened to have a bomb, I don't believe a single one actually had an hmm. actual functional bomb. And in this case, it was a live bomb that ended up working. You know, it wasn't like it was a failed attempt at making bombs. So there is some skill level involved in that. And in the end, we find out that it had two, this device had two pipe bombs basically, you know, strapped around his neck and held against his chest. Um, and the thing about pipe bombs, I should say, is that, you know, although you could probably learn how to make these things on the internet, the problem is that you have to be incredibly careful when you're making a pipe bomb. And many would-be bomb makers and, and even sophisticated and experienced bomb makers end up blowing their hands off because bombs can explode on the person making them. And so this, whoever did this, did it carefully enough not to have it go off in their own hands. And pipe bombs have this thing where you have to screw on caps at both ends of this pipe bomb. And even if, you know, one or two grains of, of black powder get caught in the threads of the pipe bomb, the friction of turning it could ignite them and then blow the whole thing up right in your hands. And so you, you have to be very physically and almost scientifically sophisticated in order to build a pipe bomb properly and not end up hurting or killing yourself. Right. And Jim, how many times have you seen it that it's a, um, a neck collar device? I've never seen that before. I mean, I've seen uh, suicide vests. I've seen uh, people with uh, a bag say, claiming that they have a bomb in it. But I've never, and I, as far as I know, no one in the world has ever fashioned a, a, a massive handcuff with a, a bomb hanging off of it and put it around somebody's neck either before or after this case. I think this is unique. And, and does that tell you something history. about like the person is sadistic? There's some kind of like, that's like a dog. It's almost like you're treating a dog or something. You're putting a collar around a guy's neck or he's putting it around his. I mean, it just seems like there's something behind. There's a symbol behind that. Or am I reading too much? I think you're right, Lisa. I, believe me, if you're stuck with this thing around your neck and you know that there's no way to get it off, 
unless you, you know, run around and do all these goofy things, you know, stop here and look by the sign and they'll find a note here and that'll tell you to go somewhere else and call this phone and, and run down the street. And that's the other aspect of this case that, that I said was, you know, genius, but extremely flawed. Brian Wells gets caught by the police. They pull him over and he stops and they order him out of the car and a deputy comes up and he handcuffs him and then has him sit down on the ground and then he slits the t-shirt that's on him. And what was on the front of that t-shirt? Um, guess. It was guess or something. Uh, guess. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of had a comic kind of tint to it, right? I mean, it's kind of like you said, Laura, the, the, the lollipop in the mouth, it's kind of childish. Um, so what what is going on here? Do they take this seriously or don't they? And when the deputy cut the sides of his shirt and saw there was an actual device and it looked complicated and it looked sophisticated, he backed away and they called the bomb squad. And of course, what they did to protect the public was shut down traffic around that area. And what that ended up doing was backing up the traffic so the bomb squad couldn't get there. And... <laughs> In the end, that was disastrous. Yeah. But before we get there, they also searched him and his car, and they found all these notes, and they were very detailed, long notes. And ba the bank robbery note was very long and complicated, and there was all these instructions. Yeah, like a scavenger hunt. Bizarre, yeah. It's a scavenger hunt, bank robbery, with a bomb strapped around somebody's neck. I mean, totally bizarre. Why go through all of that? As we know, right, Laura, from other cases that we've worked, real events, they typically, offenders, want to get in and out as quickly as possible. They want to do as little communicating as possible. They want to document as little as possible so they can hopefully get away with it and not leave evidence behind. This was the exact opposite. There was so much behavior. There was so much going on. And in the end, it guaranteed that law enforcement, of course, would have to find this guy because he's going to have to run around town and go through this big circle around the whole town in order to hopefully get the keys that will unlock this bomb that's strapped around his neck. Right. And he was so calm that that's, the police didn't believe at first that he had. He was saying the whole time, I've got a bomb around my neck. And they just they looked at his behavior and were like, there's no way this is a real bomb. Why would this guy be so calm and, you know, not ask, not really, I don't I would be hysterical. And, and so they thought it was fake. Right. So you're, you're absolutely right. And if you look at his behavior, and fortunately, we were able to also assess his behavior. And, you know, both at the bank and leaving. I mean, and then when he's on sitting on the road after having been arrested, he's very calm. He's very almost nonplussed about it until we start hearing a beeping sound. And when the beeping happens, then he starts saying, hey, I think it's going to blow up. It's going to blow up. I'm not kidding. But even that, I didn't hear desperation. I didn't hear, you know, anger. I didn't hear like him demanding that they do something because he felt he was going to die. And in fact, big reveal here, big spoiler, the bomb goes off and it creates a, a cavern in his chest and he dies laying there on the street. And it was very, very vicious. So we've had our Casper mattress in our guest room for about two years now, and every time someone stays with us, they always comment about how great they slept. And that's because the experts at Casper work tirelessly to make a quality sleep surface that cradles your natural geometry in all the right places. You know, I still remember how easy it was to get the Casper mattress out of its box and just set it up in no time at all. You know, and no matter who's staying with us, whether it's my mom with her bad back, 
Jack or Paul's cousin Josh, who tends to sleep really warm. Everybody loves sleeping on the Casper because not only does the Casper mattress provide multiple supportive memory foam for a quality sleep surface with the right amount of sink and bounce, but it's also a breathable design that helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. Casper has affordable prices because Casper cuts out the middleman and sells directly to you with hassle-free returns if you're not completely satisfied. And don't forget, you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. I mean, that's just an incredible opportunity to make sure that Casper is the right mattress for you. And now RCP listeners can get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash real crime and using our promo code real crime at checkout. Terms and conditions do apply. Again, Get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash real crime and use the promo code real crime at checkout. When I arrived, uh, he was already on his knees cuffed and he was talking calmly. So we were going back with forth with him being a willing participant or a hostage. I'm looking through the binoculars and he's talking. He's nervous, but he's not talking agitated. He's not agitated at all. And he was really concerned about getting a collar off his neck. I mean, for me, watching it was very surreal, but he seemed to be quite um, calm until the beeping began. And then with that beeping, everything changed. And I think his facial expression you know, really told the story that he was genuinely terrified that it was then very real. And I think there was a real gear change there. But I've got to say it was so surreal and horrific. And, you know, it really did leave an indelible mark on me watching that footage. I'd never seen it before. And it was just harrowing. So, yeah, but still, like, even though he, he seemed to get a little more agitated, he wasn't like saying, hey, I know who did this to me. Go get them. Have them stop. You know, like, I don't understand why he just didn't explain who had done this so that they could be apprehended and and stop the bomb altogether. Right. It seemed a little weird. I mean, he they he apparently had this, quote, cover story uh, about uh, some black guys, um, you know, attacking him and putting the collar on him. And that's the story he gave. and that's, you know, it was sort of like, you know, some other dude did it kind of story. It sounded fake to the police. It sounded fake to us when we heard about it in the behavioral analysis unit. And it doesn't make sense. It's, it's what started us thinking, this guy could have been involved in this. Both his demeanor, his calm demeanor up to that point where the, where the bomb around his neck started beeping. And then even the lack of extreme panic like the the panic that he exhibited when the bomb started beeping was i'm not kidding i think it's gonna blow up and it wasn't it i mean i know i would be frantic if i was trapped i would i would have gotten up i would have run somewhere i would have you know screamed and yelled and done everything i could to make sure that they saved my life even as something as simple as if they had just put a, a bulletproof vest between the bomb and his chest. Yeah. That might have saved his life. Oh, yeah, for sure. But there was no call for that. There was no, and maybe he wasn't, you know, smart enough to think about that. I don't know. What did you think, Laura? Well, I guess, you know, there's two things. Did did he genuinely think that it was, you know, a, a bomb that was going to go off? And did law enforcement think it genuinely was a bomb that was going to go off? I mean, you know, they seem pretty lapsadaisical in, the, in in their response to it. And, you know, closing down the roads and then the bomb squad, squad not being able to get through, of course, is a real error. Um, but it seems that no one really thought it was a bona fide bomb. Yeah, it, it seems that way. And, you know, I, I don't know if I had it strapped to me and I didn't know whether it was real or not. And I didn't know for a fact that it wasn't real. I would have really been flipping out. And that's what I would have expected from Mr. Wells. And we didn't see that at all. We saw some kind of minimal, uh, you know, raise in, 
in anxiety and, you know, right up until the point where blew up. Well, you said something interesting that made me think that we don't know what his normal state is either. So we don't know if he's delayed in some way or is not, wasn't capable of really understanding what was happening. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say what he normally is like when he's panicked or, you know, in danger, I guess. Right. It's, it's a big unknown, but that would be one of the biggest unknowns in this case for the coming decade. I, I was just going to say with victimology, I mean, you know, I think quite a lot was revealed about him. I mean, he was 46 years old and I kind of thought what the neighbor said about him was, was very interesting. And, you know, saying that he would kind of like dance around and be quite, you know, of this very sweet and kind disposition and somebody who really liked treasure hunts, um, you know, and all of that just played to me as if, you know, the, it was some kind of setup because of his vulnerability. I, I got the sense as we learn more and more from his family members, you know, as we go through the episodes. And of course, Jim, the victimology is the very first thing that you start with. Um, you know, and just the whole way that he walked into the bank, as we described, the lollipop part to it just really s stood out to me. And so when I started to join it up, having known nothing about this case at all, you know, and I I did hear from and, and read in the, the papers more recently, in talking about Evil Genius, that, you know, that footage did go viral and that there's been a lot printed about it. But, you know, I had no real understanding of the background and everything about him just struck me as somebody who was vulnerable. What did you think about them showing the actual footage of his, of the explosion? I, I, for me, I was, I thought it was handled in a really interesting way that they used the more blurry um, versions of it. I'm sure that there are much more graphic shots of it that they could have shown in the documentary, but what did you think of that? Yeah, Probably. I didn't want to see it. Yeah, but, You know, I'd seen it before. So what goes on, Jim, in the law, in the mind of law enforcement right now? I mean, there must be so much shit hitting the fans, for lack of a better word. Like, what happens? Well, obviously, when, you know, they respond to a bank robbery, a violent crime, um, cops get killed and spectators get killed in bank robberies a bunch of times. So it's it's a very serious event for law enforcement. And usually the suspect is, uh, you know, armed and dangerous. And this guy... Wells is is armed with a shotgun cane and he has a live bomb around his neck. So it's a danger to the community. So what they wanted to do was isolate him, I think, which is a good thing. They called the bomb squad as soon as they realized there was an actual device around his neck. So uh, that was the right thing to do. But they didn't think far enough to to know that when they shut down traffic on the major thoroughfare there, that it would have a ripple effect of delaying the bomb squad. And it delayed it long enough to the point where this bomb actually went off. And even though the the victim, Brian Wells, was saying, I need to go and get to the next um, place so I can find the keys to get this thing off my neck, um, they just had their guns pointed at him, kept their distance, and let the bomb go off. Um, I think they could have done more to protect him. I think... Just putting a, a bulletproof vest between his chest and the device would have gone very a long way in protecting his life. Um, and, you know, maybe wrapping another one around his face and his head. I mean, but they didn't do anything like that. His hands were handcuffed behind his back, so he couldn't, uh, uh, you know, explode the thing. And I think they should have done something to try to protect him. I mean, obviously, this is hindsight speaking, but that's what would have been the most humane thing to do at this so point. So what they did, Jim, when they uh, approach him, was would that be standard procedure, would you say, in terms of like sitting him down and handcuffing him and leaving him at a distance? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a good start, definitely. And the fact that he took the the time to sort of slit the shirt and actually look at the device and he assessed it on the spot and said, this looks like a real bomb. So I'm not going to put myself or anybody else in the community at risk. And I'm going to just leave him here away from everybody else. 
he was very compliant at that point. And I think you mentioned earlier, Laura, what, what some of the neighbors and friends said about Mr. Wells mm-hmm. is that he was kind of a pushover. And so he, he was very compliant with the law enforcement as well. And his demeanor, like I said, sort of maintained a pretty flat line during most of this whole event. So uh, it could be that he just doesn't have that either mental capacity or the the acuity to discern that this was a life-threatening situation for him. That's certainly the impression I got. But uh, of course, this is the opening sequence. So, you know, this is what they show right at, at the start. So it's difficult to get any baseline from him. But obviously we learn more as as the documentary unfolds. Right. And Lisa, you were asking another question? I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the blast didn't kill him instantly, did it? I mean, correct. he suffered, you know, no. and uh, I just feel like... And they didn't, yeah, once, yeah, once the bomb went off, I mean, he was mortally wounded, but they didn't render any assistance. They just kept their guns pointed at him, and that's the one thing in this whole event that I think the family has a real legitimate claim about. I mean, the fact is that when he, when the bomb has gone off, yes, you don't know if it's going to go off more, but you can see the guy and he's moving and, you know, it's just, he's obviously suffering and who knows, they might've been able to save his life if they had done something. I mean, why didn't they also call an ambulance? to be there on site. I mean, that should have been, that is standard procedure. And so, you know, there's some things that I don't, I think it just overwhelmed them, but Mm. not to totally find fault with them, because as I said, it's never happened before in law enforcement. So how can you be prepared for something that nobody ever anticipated? Nobody's ever gone through before. So I don't think, you know, they were totally off on what they did. They took maybe five out of the necessary seven steps, but those two last steps might have been able to save Brian's life if they had put a vest on between him and the bomb and if they had called 911 as well and had a, an ambulance standing by, that would have been helpful. The notes were, were nine pages. They were they were quite rambling in places. There were a couple of them that were instructions for Brian. There were one that he was to give to the to the bank manager. One for to the police. Bank notes. <laughs> I have a gun. Give me all your money. I mean, they, they're not they're not usually you know dissertations that are that are miles long. Who's, who's in char- like who is in charge of when something like this goes down? You know, well, makes decisions. yeah, since this cr- the crime is a bank robbery, this is FBI jurisdiction. But local law enforcement were called to the scene properly for a bank robbery in progress, and they arrested the guy. So they did a good job. Usually the FBI does not is not the first responder in a bank robbery in a small town. In a city like New York, the FBI might be the first responders, but in a city like Erie, Pennsylvania, the FBI does not have a bank robbery squad. So they would be responding after law enforcement did. But here's the problem. Because then there was a bomb that went off in public, the ATF wanted jurisdiction over the case, and because there was a gun involved, they wanted to be involved. And because it was a local crime and possibly a murder, that's a local crime. But again, because this whole entire event started with a bank robbery, that is a 100% FBI jurisdiction. So in this case, they decided at some time to create sort of a task force and they would all work together. However, as you'll see in this series, um, working together had different definitions for each of those agencies. Do you think, looking at that, um, the actual collar itself, do you think there would have been room to actually put a bulletproof vest between 
him and it. Yeah, because the collar itself, like the thick part of the collar where the locking mechanism is, um, it was in front of his neck. And then it was sort of like a rectangular box that's, that extended downward towards his chest. And if he leaned his head back, you could definitely slip a, a bulletproof vest in between the 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 box where the uh, where the pipe bombs were and his chest. Now, of course, that would have forced. I mean, it would have been like you know uh, hitting him in the chest with a very powerful sledgehammer, but it may have prevented the shrapnel from blowing a hole in his chest. Right. And also, they would have to also protect you know, his neck and face, because obviously if the blast couldn't go backwards, it might go up and, and could have killed him, you know, could have decapitated him. Yeah. I mean, just, just horrific. And I mean, the other part to it, as, as graphic as it is, I mean, the decision to decapitate him, I mean, I, I think they, didn't they decapitate him at the scene to get the actual collar itself off of him? Mm-hmm. I, I know it sounds terrible, but I mean, you know, an autopsy is very, and this is graphic. So if any of our listeners don't want to hear it, an autopsy is incredibly onerous. I mean, they do a Y incision coming from your belly all the way up your chest. And then and they take a saw and they cut through your chest bone and they, they bro- break open the ribs cage and they, they take out all your organs. And then they do an incision around the back of your head and literally peel your scalp and face forward and then take a saw and cut off the top of your skull and remove the brain. That's in a normal autopsy. So to me, separating two of the, you know, of the vertebrae in order to remove the head so that they didn't, A, explode the, uh, any remaining bombs that might be in this device, and, you know, to protect the people during the autopsy, the fact that they had to remove his head, it's just, it's literally, to me, it's just almost exactly similar to a regular autopsy. I'm sorry for the family, of course, that they have to know about that, but the the process of a regular autopsy, again, is very, very onerous. I mean, I get the whole autopsy thing, and but that decision... Um, you know, must have been very distressing for the family and very difficult for them to try and understand what was going on as well. And then to hear that on top of it and that he, you know, is seen as a, a suspect. I think, you know, that there was a lot for them to process and that decapitation must have been very, very difficult for them to understand. You know, what I didn't understand was they said that the family was not able to have an open casket funeral because of that decapitation and i just don't understand that i mean because certainly they could have uh very easily um, created a situation where the body was sewn back together they would have to put a high collar on the on the body or wrap something around their neck but they should have been able to put that back together um i just don't understand why they made a decision law enforcement or the medical examiner or whoever prepared the body that they could not do an open casket unless of course it was that was a an excuse what might have actually happened was the bomb may have damaged his face to such an extent that they couldn't reconstruct that and that would be a reason for no open casket i just don't believe that the fact that they had to sever his head in order to get the device off was actually what prevented them from having an open casket. Right. And so we're essentially left, you know, after he is, um, you know, blown up, it, it's very much the police and having to piece together the kind of the who done it. You know, was it him operating alone? They, they have a, was it a nine page letter that was written? Um, multiple letters that were written. <laughs> multiple letters that were written. And of course, they're trying to figure out, and, and the whole sort of essence of evil genius is kind of like a who done it, isn't it? Trying to piece together how he ended up having a, a bomb collar around his neck, which has never been seen before, you know, and what part he played in it, and who the other, you know, potential co conspirators were. Right. And I think that will lead us into episode two. Uh, when we come back to talk about evil genius 
the Netflix series. Amazingly well done and a riveting series. I, I couldn't take my eyes away from it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I watched it on the plane over to the UK. And so the co-directors are Trey Borzaleri and Barbara Schroeder. Um, I mean, he was, it's 10 years in the making, um, which is quite incredible in and of itself, isn't it? A 10 year project. Well, you've done a 10 year project as well, Jim, and uh, it fits. Yeah, well, so I, I'm really looking forward to talking to Barbara Schroeder and Trey because there's so many questions mm-hmm. about when they thought they would, this would end. And, you know, and I also want to ask about, you know, the du- Duplass brothers produced this. Jim, I don't know if you were familiar with Jay and Mark Duplass, but you know, they're actors. And so I'm really interested in how they came to be involved because it surely pushed this forward. Yeah, Mm. I can't wait to talk to them. Great. So some of you may not know, but we have a real crime profile book club going on. And last month we covered Michelle McNamara's blockbuster hit, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And this month we're actually doing another really cool book I happen to meet the producers of um, because they're making a television show out of it. And it's called A False Report, A True Story of Rape in America. And it's by T. Christian Miller and Ken Armstrong. Um, So that's going to be our next book club book that we'll probably do in about a month, somewhere in late July. So if you want to be part of book club, go to our Facebook page and like our Facebook page and just look for instructions. Um, We use the Zoom application so that we can all log in. And if you want to be on screen, you can. If you don't want, if you just want to like instant message us questions, you can. And it's moderated by our wonderful listener, Dean Lafon, who is in Australia. And he's my wingman. And we had such a great time last time. I really look forward to this next book. Again, A False Report, A True Story of Rape in America. And it's going to be coming to a television station near you next fall. And that show is going to be called Unbelievable. So there you go. I hope everybody can join us. It was super fun. Well... Till next time, thank you for listening to Real Crime Profile. If you like our podcasts, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800 Two zero 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 two four seven. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214-946-4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the domestic violence hotline on 800-799. 7233.